Well, good morning from California. I'm Michael Benner, and this is The Wisdom of the Soul. This is class number 31, and I appreciate you being here with us live. Uh, You may be listening to a podcast. We're on all players and podcast apps, an edited uh, edited version of this live class. We uh, we just take out the meditation and the Q and A. So join us live if you uh, would like to enjoy that part of it, particularly the the opening med, which we're about to do. And um, we're also on YouTube. The whole video is posted on YouTube. Both can be searched as the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. That's the name of the podcast and the YouTube channel. Ageless Wisdom. Mystery School. I'm not real good at self-promotion, I guess. Um, It occurred to me this morning that I've done uh, 30 of these, (laughs) and I've never mentioned my private intensives, and I'm not going to go on uh, uh, about it at length other than that I still do that. I have a handful of private clients, some of whom I see on a weekly basis, some every other week or even once a month. Um, Some people just schedule a single session and the first one is uh, free of charge, an intake session to see if uh, uh, I might be able to help you with your anxiety issue, uh, couples counseling. Most of the work we do is around some sort of stress and anxiety and and how to manage the effects of that, whether it's, uh, uh, oh, OCD, some obsession, obsessive thinking, or compulsive behavior, uh, panic attacks, or just a feeling of anxiety and and nervousness and trepidation, and uh, you want to learn to manage that. But also uh, relationship management, communication skills. A lot of people are looking for that. What's a better way to argue, um, or have a discussion that is not argumentative. Um, so again, the intake is free. You can schedule it at michaelbenner.com or at the podcast site, which is theagelesswisdom.com. And the T-H-E is part of it. Theagelesswisdom.com is the podcast site. michaelbenner.com takes you to all of my sites including the private counseling and go in there and poke around. And there's also a link to the Zoom class in here if you want to introduce a friend or an associate to this class. You can do that there as well, michaelbenner.com. Okay, enough of the commercials. Thank you for being here. Today we're going to talk about uh, letting go of our resistance to change. And the letting go or releasing resistance to change is a lot like change itself in so many areas where people will commonly say things to me like, uh, Michael, how do, here's a common one. How do I overcome my fear? Uh, how do I conquer or defeat this bad habit or this pattern, this tendency? And we always think in terms of conquering or defeating or overcoming. And when it comes to fear, anxiety, and stress, all that does is add more stress. So it's counterintuitive. It's backward thinking. How do I conquer my attempts to conquer life? (laughs) How do I overcome my patterns of attempting to overcome what I would be better off accepting? And so the answer is you don't overcome your fear. You don't conquer anything. You let it go. And that's just huge. So how do I release my resistance to change? How do I let go of my holding on? Does that make sense? Because that's what your resistance to change is. Um, The catch-22 in all of this is that while human beings in general do not like change and are naturally resistant to it, 
it's uh, stressful not to change. To resist change uh, causes stress as well as um, attempting to uh, fight it. And so what I'm trying to say is there's going to be stress regardless of how you respond to the inevitability of change in our lives. If you do nothing, life's going to change and, um, and in any event, whatever your response, there's going to be some stress you have to deal with. So what I'm saying is rather than struggle with the change, you have to learn to go with the flow. And the, the issue is similar to emotions themselves. We say, perhaps, how do I uh, manage my anger? How do I deal with uh, this uh, set of negative feelings? Here, here we're talking about fear again. Uh, every feeling that hurts, anger, hatred, jealousy, envy, uh, gosh, even apathy, oddly, um, has some fear and anxiety and stress in it. If it hurts, if it's uncomfortable, if uh, if it uh, irritates you, there's some sort of stress or anxiety there. And uh, how do I overcome that? You don't. You, you let it go. And uh, recognize that the feeling itself is not the issue, don't you see? Um, any more than you would ask a mechanic to uh, fix the red light on your dashboard, you would expect him or her instead to go under the hood. And so it is with our hurtful feelings. We uh, need to recognize them as valuable symptoms. Yeah, they hurt, you know, so-called negative feeling. They hurt. They make us uncomfortable. They irritate us and frustrate us and sometimes even humiliate us, but they're just symptoms. You need to dig deeper, go further. And then if you, uh, as, as you find the problem, as you locate the problem and then understand it, then the whole system resets. The fear is gone. The heartache is, is healed. Um, face it and embrace it is what we're talking about. And that goes with, with our topic of the day, change nothing is more inevitable than change. <laughs> it's, the, it's the one thing you can count on. And I want to do our opening med, and then we'll talk about why that's so. And uh, uh, a couple of references in mystical literature to change that we've only touched on briefly in the past. Uh, the ring pass knot is a fascinating allegory, and also the concept known as the dweller on the threshold. And we'll, we'll even talk about a, a concept called punctuated evolution. And uh, take a look at the patterns of change, because it's not smooth and linear. And change is, uh, can be gradual, or it can be very, very fast, but it's not a nice smooth curve. So we'll talk about that also. Uh, dwell around the threshold and the uh, ring pass knot. That's our concept for, that's our topic for the day today. So let's do an opening meditation. Let's get comfortable in your chairs or on your furniture. If you're sitting cross-legged, that's fine. If you're in a chair uh, or a sofa or something, put your feet flat on the floor. Sit up straight with your shoulders back. There's no reason you can't use the back of the chair if you'd like, but sit up. You want to open up your rib cage and get a sense of being balanced. Your head above your, your shoulders and uh, your head and shoulders above your hips. Nice and straight, feet flat on the floor. And close your eyes and begin by just bringing your awareness into how it feels to be in your body. And I usually suggest, and today is no different, that you bring your awareness from its tendency to reside in the head down into your body. And begin by welcoming in any physical feeling or sensation 
in your body. It might be in your toe, in your ankle, in uh, your belly, uh, the back of your shoulder, and any place there is any kind of irritation or frustration or any discomfort whatsoever. Instead of uh, resisting it or pushing at it, let it in. Let it come in. Say, come on in. Say, maybe it's just an itch you'd like to scratch. See if you can avoid scratching it and just let it go. Just feel a letting go in that area. Same thing with your tummy or your intestines. Just feel a letting go, which is really a turning over, don't you see? It's like releasing personal responsibility to the brain and the unconscious mind. As if to say to that part of you that's autonomic, this is your job, you take care of this. I'm going to create and sense a letting go feeling of every sensation in my body, good, bad, or otherwise, not even judging, just accepting. And maybe even being grateful for feeling as good as you do, feeling as well and as healthy as you actually do. Maybe even reflect on how often you feel really good. Even if there are chronic problems that you find at times distressful, most of the time we feel pretty good, don't we? How about be grateful for that? as a way of getting better, as a way of promoting healing, as a way of putting your attention on the goal, the desired outcome or objective, rather than the problem. I think we should also take a moment just to acknowledge to ourselves silently the fact that we made an effort to come to class live and participate in this meditation. You know, that alone makes you a pretty exceptional individual. Maybe you've tried living like everybody else. Getting enough power, enough money, enough material stuff to make your life work. And to a large extent, it seems to be working, but there's always something, right? There's always something we seem to be overlooking or missing. There's missing pieces and parts. Something here we're overlooking. And since our waking lives are so exclusively focused on the outer world, to take 10 or 15 minutes once a day to turn away from the outer world and look within, that's turning from the effect toward the cause. from the response to the symptom, the stimulus. Looking within is a way of acknowledging that to a large extent, the world we see, the world we experience is of our own making. Oh, there's a great deal of going on out there that we seem to have no control over whatsoever. 
where we get blindsided, feel at effect and victimized by a life being done to us, you can acknowledge some of that. But let's orient ourselves toward the idea that increasingly we can recognize our contribution to that perception. That life is what we make it, not only in our actions and our behaviors, but not only those we initiate, but in our responses, in our reflexive reactions, in our attitudes, in our beliefs, and just the way we look at things. That's where control begins, not in managing what's done to you, not in controlling other people, but in managing our perception and response. That's, that's where choice is found. How many different ways can I look at this situation? And how many different ways can I respond? Go beyond the either-or, beyond the all-or-nothing. By reminding yourself, I have choices. More choices than are immediately apparent. What am I going to do? What will I do? What should I do? What do you think I should do? Well, what do you want me to do about it? And I would suggest look for more choices in how you perceive and how you initiate a response. And be the awareness, the consciousness that can choose to substitute an even-tempered, well-reasoned response for a reflexive reaction that we often regret, sometimes immediately. You ever catch yourself saying, I can't believe I'm acting like this? I can't believe I just said that? But we're so invested in being right, so invested in being defensive and willing to exchange deep and profound understanding for the need to be right and to defend it, even if you, in the process, realize you're handling this badly. Take a breath. First thing you do when that occurs to you, when you become conscious, take a big breath. Do that now. Take a nice big breath. And as you exhale, feel a letting go. That's a reset, a chance to start over. To replace the need to be right and that defensive attitude so often found in our argumentation, with a desire to understand. First of all, understand the conflict. Devote yourself to understanding the others who may be involved in this. Put your agenda aside for a second. You can, <laughs> you can come back to it later. And do something that we rarely ever do. Devote yourself to understanding the other, the adversary. Someone you know well and who is sitting right in front of you, someone you read about in a book or saw on TV, you never will meet, but they're still irritating you, bringing up all kinds of hurt and anxiety and frustration. Devote yourself to understanding them especially those that frighten you. Understand your enemy. This is not about anybody being right or wrong. Just 
forget the judgment altogether and seek to understand from a place of compassion. And then the next level has to do with how am I contributing to their frustration and their hurt and their anger and their hatred and and their fear? And is there anything that I could do to stop poking them where they're already bruised? If you say something that hurts somebody, why would you keep saying it? If you're doing something that irritates someone, why keep doing it? Find an alternative. Devote yourself simply to empathy and compassion. That is such a significant shift that when you then get around to looking at your position, often it just doesn't seem so important that you be right, that you score a point that you make them wrong, especially when it's someone you love, and find profound pleasure and contentment in simply understanding others and yourself. Yeah. I want to understand. I want to become more and more conscious, more aware. And that's a relaxation skill. Three minutes of watching your breath. Just put your attention on the bottom of your nose and from a fixed point, still, quiet, as the watcher, not the breather, just the observer, watch your body breathe itself until you hear my voice again. Three minutes.
Keep in mind, the goal is not concentration, but awareness of when the mind drifts, which is inevitable. So don't admonish yourself or judge yourself as a bad meditator. The goal is to shorten the amount of time that it takes to realize that the mind has drifted from watching your breath. And then simply bring your awareness gently back to the bottom of the nose as the observer of the body breathing itself. Every time you're distracted, simply say to yourself, well, of course, giggle, let it go, (laughs) put your awareness back on the gentle, peaceful observation of the body breathing itself, all by itself. Prepare to bring yourself back to the wide awake state by simply forming the intention to do so, number one. Secondly, feel a uh, floating up feeling, kind of a coming into your physical senses feeling, the way you feel in the morning when you wake up naturally and normally. And third, eyes open, wide awake, Open your eyes now, wide awake, alert, back in the room, and take a nice big deep breath and maybe a stretch, ah, like you're waking up. Shrug your shoulders, move a little bit, get back into the body. Welcome back, welcome home. Nice to be here, nice to be anywhere, right? So as I was saying before the meditation, uh, the inevitability of change in many mystical traditions, this is simply called the law of impermanence. That all physical objects, all material objects are in the state of decay. Um, Molecules decay. Uh, Skyscrapers (laughs) decay. Big or little, uh, food spoils and rots, but uh, titanium and steel and iron will rust and corrode and fade. Not only are material objects in a state of permanent decay and change, but uh, so too are thoughts and feelings. Feelings last generally a little longer than thoughts, but thoughts move on. It's a thought stream, a stream of thoughts, a train of thoughts, one car after another. To watch yourself thinking and to be the watcher is such a wonderful sense of liberation in that. We deceive ourselves when we believe we are the thinker. And you can always review the classes from a few weeks ago where we talked about the different kinds of thought, task-related thought, task-unrelated thought, uh, so-called intrusive thinking, And our tendency to believe that's us. You know, when you're not, when when your thinking is not uh, oriented toward any particular task, 
and your mind is just ram r randomly generating ideation. We assume that's us thinking. Uh, <laughs> and are confounded by the fact that many of those tasks unrelated or intrusive thoughts are contradictory. That uh, or We're aware of that, but it, we, we often don't take it deeper. Like, if that's me thinking, why would I have contradictory thoughts? Why do I argue with myself? Uh, could it be that these are various streams of influence and that the idea that there is a, a chairman of the board or some sort of uh, CEO in our brain uh, may be an illusion. In fact, increasingly, uh, empirical research is indicating that's the case, the illusion of the physical self, of the ego self, which the ego loves. So, of course, it's always going to promote that illusion. But it leads to a feeling of being the separate self because we live in an object of separated form. So why wouldn't this self be separated? And then we're off on a search for love to reconnect. When in fact, the eternal and omnipresent nature of love means we never were separated. It's all an illusion. You're not separate. And uh, you're, you're not that separated self. Is there a sense of self somewhere between unity and diversity, uh, a harmonious sense of individuation that is well-balanced and well-integrated, standing between the one life, the all that is, divinity, monism, Panpsychism, it's panentheism, it's got a lot of names that we've begun to explore. And this illusion of living in a world of separated form, a world of names and forms. It's not just forms, we have names for things that are not forms, don't we? Can you think of a name for a thing that is not a thing? Can you? How about sky? Everybody knows what the sky is. Where is the sky? Point to the sky. It's right there. Well, it's my ceiling. Above that's the roof. But above my ceiling and the roof is the sky. In fact, today it's really, really blue. Really? Well, how high do you have to go to touch the sky? Oh, well, you, you can't touch the sky. How far do you have to go to be in outer space? Is outer space somewhere else? Most people presume it is. Until you see those pictures of Earth from the moon or pictures of Earth from Voyager or somewhere else and Oh my God, Earth is in outer space. We're in outer space now. I didn't know that. I thought outer space was somewhere else. I thought the sky was somewhere else. The sky doesn't even exist. There is no sky. It's just the name. Oh, the atmosphere, is that what you meant? Or the appearance of blueness in the daytime and blackness? At night, and don't you love the transitions in the morning and the evening? What the sky does. My sky doesn't look like your sky. Not if you have any clouds in it. My sunset, I bet, looked very different than your sunset last night. In fact, it all depends on your mood. Have you ever been in a really bad mood and driven through a beautiful area? Or how about this? How about you're sick? God forbid you should be sick. May you be well. But every once in a while, we get sick. We get the flu or something. Just maybe a bad head cold. You feel horrible. And you're driving through some beautiful place. It doesn't seem very beautiful, does it? <laughs> it's like, is it possible your entire reality could be colored by your perception of it? Of course. But let's... 
let's talk about the fact that the sky is changing. And uh, everything is moving. The planets are... I, I just found this uh, face on my Apple Watch where it shows the planets. Imagine having on my watch a 3D display of the planets and their orientation. And But the planets go around the sun. The solar system goes around the galaxy. Everything spins. Everything is in constant flux. Get used to it. And if we do nothing about change, it'll stress us. And if we attempt to resist change, where stress is compounded, and even if we go with the change and try to go with the flow, as I said earlier, there still are unexpected issues that occur with change. But since change is inevitable and unavoidable, and we see the law of impermanence in Eastern philosophy and the world in flux and Western philosophy, wasn't it uh, Heraclitus that said, no man, no person steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river, and they are not the same person. That's quite profound. It's quite liberating. It's quite wonderful. I can see where someone might find that stressful, scary, and intimidating, but there is something that remains while everything changes around us. Do you have any idea what that is? While everything around you is changing, as I've just described, is there anything that doesn't change? Is there one thing at least that remains permanent and unchanging? It's awareness, it's consciousness. It's often called love, but then easily conflated with the emotional connotations of love. And we see love as an emotion having a very clear ebb and flow. Love as an emotion rises and falls, doesn't it? You could be really in love with somebody and a month later they upset you, they disappoint you, they insult you, and now you're not feeling so loving toward them. <laughs> so the emotion that we refer to as love or joy or happiness, uh, that's in constant flux like all other feelings and all other things and all thoughts. But... Uh, As Consciousness, capital C Consciousness, as Awareness, capital A Awareness, it's always there. I would have you consider this, and I'd like you to toy with this concept this week, until our, our class next week. I want you to imagine what it would be like to sit in a dark room with your eyes closed. You're sitting in a dark room. There's not any light at all and your eyes are closed. And then you open those eyes and nothing changes. Everything is still black. There's not a bit of light. So perhaps there are things here that could be seen if there were some light reflected off them, but you're not aware of them because there's no light. And yet your eyes are open. They're capable of receiving light. And so it is with consciousness and awareness. It's always there. It's the one permanent, eternal, and infinite thing <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> it's such an inadequate word. Concept. Awareness itself. Uh, there's a lot of work in quantum physics around this because it's the it's 
again, forgive me, I have to use the word thing. It's the one thing you cannot get behind. In, in Daisy chaining your way back from, well, cause and effect, cause and effect, this effect had to have a cause. And now that I look at that cause, well, maybe that was an effect of a previous cause. So let's look at that cause. Oh, and then I see that's an effect of another cause. And I daisy chain my way all the way back, and then you get to my awareness of it. And you can't get behind that. It existed because I'm aware of it. If I was not aware of it, it would not exist. You could argue that something exists that you're not aware of. But what would be the point? It takes some level of awareness, right? A awareness on some level. Like, I'm aware that it exists, although none of my physical senses are cluing me into it because it is at a distance. I'm aware that the Great Wall of China exists. I saw a photo on a couple of occasions, several pictures of the Great Wall of China. Pretty sure it's there. All these people wouldn't lie to me. Yeah, I'm aware of it on that level, but you've never seen it. So you have an awareness that it exists. There's a capital A awareness, a capital C consciousness, which is the ground of being. It's divinity itself. It's the absolute. It's the ultimate. It's the Godhead. Awareness, consciousness is the Godhead. In philosophy, it's simply called the absolute, which makes everything else relative, right? Makes everything else subjective. Now, the funny thing about the change that's happening against this uh, uh, background of uh, awareness, this common ground of being that is pure awareness, these changes, again, are not linear like a smooth line. Uh, they're not a curve like a parabolic curve. Uh, it's a it, change tends to be, and there's many exceptions to this, but nevertheless, in a general sense, change is herky-jerky. It's a stair-step function called punctuated evolution. We see this in evolution. It's called punctuated evolution. But we see this stair-step function in many forms of change, where things that go along relatively unchanged, and I say relatively, it may be a very gradual one degree slope, right? Just uh, the slightest change you don't even notice. And then there's a leap and everything changes or lots of things change to a great degree. <laughs> and then they go along relatively unchanged for quite a period of time until there's another quantum leap. So you get this stair-step function, don't you see? That's worthy of pondering. Achoo, excuse me, that sneak, sneeze <sighs> came out of right field. Punctuated evolution, that's called. Well, we see this in mystical literature referred to in a couple of different ways. I want to introduce you to these ideas because they are provocative and, and, and fun really, to observe. Uh, one is called the dweller on the threshold, and the other is the ring pass knot. Uh, I guess I can do them in either order. The uh, If you go deep enough into the literature, there are differences and distinctions in the way these allegories are applied. But for our purposes today, just dealing with the inevitability of change and our natural resistance to it, uh, the difficulty we have going with the flow. Um, doesn't much matter. I think both are relative, relevant and relative. Let's start with ring pass knot. The best way to think of ring pass knot is when you drop a pebble into a pool of water, 
you'll see a ring that radiates out. And because everything that radiates has a peak and a trough, an ebb and a flow, you'll see these little ripples, one consecutive ripples, one after another, these circles, concentric circles radiating out from the point of impact. Those are the rings we're talking about when we describe the ring pass knot. And I'd like to use as uh, a further example of this a, a bird's egg. Um, or it could be a reptile egg. It doesn't much matter. You know what an egg looks like. Let's think of a bird's egg in a nest. That's the first ring pass knot for that baby bird. And there's no reason that the baby bird inside that egg should come out. It's uh, warm, it's safe, it's the only thing that it's ever known. Think of times in your life where that's all you wanted, was something warm, safe, and familiar. Why would the bird ever come out of there? Well, because there's a little sack of, of food and oxygen in that egg which eventually runs out. And so as the bird depletes its food and its oxygen, it's getting hungry and it's running out of uh, air. And so it begins to thrash about and uh, pecking at the egg, eventually cracks the egg and comes out only so that it can breathe. And then complaining about its situation it gets a little grub or a worm or mom comes along and feeds it. But now the second ring pass knot is the bird nest, right? Not very big, although some are. We have an eagle cam that we watch in Big Bear, California, right across the valley from us. And we watched a, a baby eagle born this past spring. Boy, it was remarkable watching <laughs> watching how fast this baby eagle grew. But the point is, the reason I bring it up is the nest must have been six or eight feet across. It is huge. And uh, yet the bird is confined to the nest. It, it can't get out, right? And we would watch this 24-7 webcam that's trained on this nest and, and see this bird every day growing, getting bigger at such a remarkable rate. And then trying to fly, you know, flapping its wings and building strength in the wings. And then it got to a point where it would sort of raise itself up four inches or so and then exhaust and collapse back into the nest. But there came a day when that bird went out on the front porch <laughs> this big tree limb and uh, stood out there for about 10 minutes flapping its wings and then resting and flapping its wings and resting and then suddenly taking off and the people up in Big Bear that sponsored that camera have a second camera that's a long shot so they cut to that camera and you could see the bird uh Flying madly, it's funny to see an eagle flying like a duck. I mean, just madly flapping. <laughs> it had never flown before. Madly flapping its wings just long enough to get to another tree a few yards away and then collapsing, exhausted onto a tree branch. But now it went beyond the nest, the second ring pass knot. But it can't fly very far, so... Maybe if it can only fly 50 feet and you use that radius to proscribe a circle, a 50-foot circle, and then a week later it's a 200-foot circle, um, the ring pass not gets larger and larger as the animal matures. We go through that in our lives. And every time we approach the ring, beyond which we cannot go, the egg, the nest. Sorry, that's as far as I can fly. Well, I'm preparing to migrate. I'm going to Florida for the 
I'm going south for the winter with the other migratory birds. Now the ring pass knot is expanded even, even farther. But don't you see that as you approach the ring, there's tension. As you come upon the breakthrough, whether it's just before you break out of the egg or whether you risk your life leaving the nest, that could be going off to college, you know, or moving on to your parents' home for the first time, or finally getting a car that's reliable and you can actually drive long distances. Um, there's tension that builds. There's a resistance to that change, that that ring represents your resistance to change. And to comprehend that and to contemplate that, to be aware of the way the resistance is building will help you facilitate that change, that needed change, that necessary change, needed and necessary to what? To your growth, to your evolution, to your unfoldment. So the beauty of the ring pass knot is that it demonstrates whatever example or allegory you use, the way in which the point where change happens in our life is preceded by the greatest resistance. It's sort of a darkest before the dawn thing. Or um, my friend Marilyn Ferguson, who wrote the Aquarian Conspiracy, used to call it the 115950 phenomena where it's the change you need uh, the blessing whatever the grace that you need often does not arrive until the very last minute and you sort of feel like the universe is toying with you but uh, the, the the other allegory that we find in mystical literature and theosophy in particular, I think Blavatsky coined the term, Madame Blavatsky, the dweller on the threshold. This is the same idea. It's a very similar idea that you come to a doorway or a passage in your life, some sort of transition, some quantum leap, um, it could be committing to a relationship and deciding, yeah, I think we really should get married. Or um, choosing uh, to get student loans so you can go to college and really tormenting yourself. I don't know if I want to take on this financial burden. And Is a university education really worth it? Um, do I need the information I'm getting or... Maybe if you're really bright, you realize college is not about the information you learn. It's about learning how to learn and how to think critically, how to use a library, how to avoid anecdotal evidence and look for repetition and validation and what's a high credible source and what's a low credible source. And critical thinking patterns are more important than the information. But be that as it may, it's just another example of a major change. And so often we get right to the edge of the threshold. We open the doorway, we put one leg through the doorway, and then we stop. And here we are, the dweller on the threshold, don't you see? We're at the edge of the ring. We're the bird that's cracking the egg, but... I don't know what's out there. It's sort of scary. Maybe I should stay inside the egg. <laughs> no, I can't do that. I'm running out of food and water. Well, I cracked the egg. Now at least I'm getting the air. But I'm running out of food. I got to get out of this egg. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. So resistance to change, okay? If we don't roll with the change, it's going to cause problems. It's going to stress us. And uh, the problems get worse. And yet, if we try to roll with the change, 
there are always the, uh, the, the unanticipated consequences of it. And so sometimes we just, we pref- let me say it this way. It seems we prefer the familiar to an improved situation that has changed in ways that we cannot anticipate. And so because anything new, whether it's much better or not, is stressful and frightening. Even if we know that it's going to be better because it couldn't possibly be worse than it is, our suffering is so familiar that we tend to hold on and change uh, and resist change that holds the promise of improvement and growth. And the funny thing is that we describe that more often than not as being stuck. And in fact, we're not stuck, we're holding on. We're holding on to fear and suffering, but telling ourselves the fear is holding us back. The fear is holding on to us, that we're stuck because we don't know the consequences of the change that we have to confront as the dweller on the threshold or as one who approaches the high tension of the ring pass knot and the breakthrough that needs to be made, right? The fix for all of this is to see yourself as an agent for change. To see yourself, your awareness and your consciousness as existing for the primary purpose of growing and evolving, becoming more and more aware, which is a change. It's an enhancement, it's an improvement, but it may bring with it consequences that we're not familiar with, and so it's scary. And I'd rather stay with the misery and the suffering that I'm familiar with than risk the chance of improvement because it's unknown and generates fear. And I'm going to hold on to that. What is fear? But uh, it causes tension. Fear is a holding on response, not just physically, but holding on to thought patterns, holding on to heartache, holding on, holding on, holding on for dear life. And then claiming, I'm stuck. Don't you see? So, big breath. Let's do this together. A big breath. And as you exhale, feel feel yourself letting go and say, this is what I do. This is who I am. I'm an agent for change. Trust. Trust. Trust yourself. Trust life. Suspicious? Trust and verify, (laughs) but still, you know, trust comes in varying degrees. Trust but verify. You must have questions or comments about this, and if you don't want to unmute, maybe you could just write a brief comment in the chat box and Melinda can read that. If you want to expound on it, I'd love to have you uh, when when, uh, we get to it unmute. You don't need to turn your camera on. But even if you just put a comment in the box or a question, well, what about this? Well, what do I do when I feel this way? How can I become a better change agent? How can I become more graceful and more elegant in not only anticipating change, but embracing change? And knowing that while some of, some, some of the change in our lives will immediately appear to be beneficial and some of it will be confusing and hurtful and maybe, you, maybe it causes you to feel some regret that you shouldn't have made the change, but flow with it, learn from it, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise. You could choose not to judge it and accept it for what it is and just keep learning. 
And what if the game is rigged? You know, I think in my experience, there are many times that life would touch me lightly to try to get my attention as if a feather's touch, but I just blew it off. But it was something that I needed, some growth, some change that I needed. And so life gave me a little shove, a, a, a gentle little push. But again, again, I was I was too busy. I had uh, a million things going on. That I'm a very important person. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm a very important person, right? And I'm in a hurry. And eh, eh, get out of my way. What are you doing on my highway? And uh, I've got to get where I'm going. I've got to do what needs to be done here. You don't seem to understand. You're in my way. And eh, eh. So I missed the feather's touch. I missed the gentle shove. So life found a sharp stick. And it poked me with a stick and it hurt. And now I'm suffering the pain. It's added to my own self-imposed suffering. But I still don't know what to do because I'm afraid of change. I'm resistant to it. I'm the bird inside the egg. Or maybe in the nest, but afraid to fly. And so life finds a brick and hits me over the head with a brick and I go to my knees and I say, okay, you got my attention. But as we manage our stress and our anxiety, as we take more and more responsibility for our lives, as our awareness expands and our consciousness raises, Maybe we don't have to wait to be hit over the head by a brick to get the message. Maybe even before the sharp stick, we could feel the gentle push, the nudge of life saying, better wake up, look over here, and maybe even the feathers touch. And then you'd have the answer to why does life have to be so painful? Why does it have to be so difficult? Because we're not paying attention. What are we doing instead? Looking out here into the world at this kaleidoscopic house of mirrors made up of a reflection of my consciousness and the attitudes and beliefs and expectations of everyone else I encounter. What we call life is pretty much an agreement that it is the way it is, not the way it should be. We all agree it could be better life, right? <laughs> Why does it have to be like this? So that we learn to pay attention, that's all. And to do that, you have to close your eyes and turn within, you see, to the cause. As long as you're looking out through your eyes, you're looking at a world of effect. Where does the movie go? If you go to a, uh, I guess movie theaters is still is making a, a, a comeback. They're doing their best to hold on and make a comeback. When you go to a movie theater, you pay 12 or 15 bucks for a movie. And uh, 25 or $30 for a box of popcorn. <laughs> you want to forget that it's just light on the wall. You want to believe it's real. Well, okay, you're invested in it. I understand that. But where does it go when it's over? It doesn't go anywhere. It's still racked up in the projector in the back. Or if it's a digital, digital movie, it's uh, on a computer that's hooked to a projector behind you. And what you've been engaged with is simply the reflection on the wall all this time. Where does the movie go? Where do you go when you die? Nowhere. You see? So why be intimidated and, and, and bullied? Why suffer these projections 
balance, at least. You have to live with your eyes open. You live in a physical world. Just, I'm suggesting, balance it with an insight and an awareness, an ongoing, ever-expanding, ever-elevating perspective of the internal landscape, the source of what you see reflected in the world. Um, due, to, due to a vision, I haven't driven a car in quite a while, 14 or 15 years. But I remember driving the freeway in L.A., and if I adopted the attitude, there's a little game I used to play, and it's quite remarkable the way this works. If I adopt the attitude of uh, the synchronized swimmer, and I pretend that everybody on the freeway around me is on the same page, that we've all been trained in synchronized driving, and we're all doing our best to coordinate and cooperate, there'll still be an occasional jerk that comes speeding up the inside or that passes you and recklessly and cuts in front of you. But I'm telling you, if you change your attitude, the experience of driving on that freeway will change enormously. It will seem as if most people got the memo and most people really are coordinating their efforts, doing their best to let you move and you let them in and, oh, they're going to exit, see their turn signal is on, so let them go, let them go, step on your brake, not the accelerator. It, it'll, it'll change enormously just by changing your attitude or your belief about it. Again, there'll always be an occasional jerk that's out to disprove the theory. You, you, you can see the same thing, by the way, if you change. We're talking about change today. Your attitude of people. Um, what if there's someone that you just really don't like? Uh, they just push your buttons. They just yank your chain. They, they trigger you. They irritate the bejesus out of you, and you just have a hard time being around them. Play with that attitude of yours. Change it. Replace it. What if you just spend a moment or two thinking of, from a place of compassion about their suffering? And even if you don't know, just presume that there must be reasons why they're behaving the way they're behaving. And maybe you could understand them. Maybe you'll be limited in it, but just an attempt to empathize and have some compassion for their suffering will, will make it so much easier to tolerate them. And then they will change. If you treat people the way you wish they were, the way you wish they would be, they tend to change. <laughs> then, you have to, then you have to accept, well, it was all in my head. I was contributing with my funky attitude to their behavior in ways that I'm now beginning to understand. And this whole idea of being a victim of life and resisting change, holding on for dear life. You know, the, the roller coaster allegory is a great one where some people you know, they hold on for dear life. They're strapped in, the bar came down on the roller coaster, they're locked in. Roller coaster's been here 50 years, nobody's ever died yet, but you're terrified and you hold on for dear life. You get off at the end, you're sick. But in front of you and behind you are people that are loving this and their hands are up in the air and they're shouting whoopee and they're screaming and they're loving it. And at the end, they jump out and run around and get in line again because they just can't get enough of scare me to death. But it's the same roller coaster ride, don't you see? It's the same ride. 
Whether you call that anxiety excitement, oh boy, I'm going to get on the roller coaster, or whether you call it fear and say, no, 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 I don't want to change, no, don't make me change, no, please. It's the same roller coaster. You're going to ride it one way or the other. So we don't want to be reckless, but we also don't want to be paralyzed by our fears. Trust. Learn to trust. Trust life. Trust other people. Trust yourself. That's where it, well, that's where it begins. When, when private clients come to me and say, I have a problem trusting this other person. I say, often is not, to what extent is that a reflection of your uh, difficulty trusting yourself as a judge of character? Don't you see? And then, oh, I see, some big piece of my difficulty trusting Joe or Sally or Nancy or Bill is not trusting myself. So if I learn to trust myself more, then it'll be easier for me to be a really good judge of character about the extent to which I can trust others and then life itself. What if the whole game is rigged? What if the whole game is rigged? And you get what you expect and you go where you look and you reap what you sow and a little rain and disaster and hurtful consequence is part of everybody's life, but we can, gosh, I'm telling you the bulk of that is our own resistance, our digging in our heels, our refusal to change. That's what amps it up. And you can let go of all of that and roll with the change, be more wide-eyed, more awake and more aware and be the agent for change that you are not just change but improvement evolution this is not random change we're talking about it's growthful change it's learning from the pain learning from our mistakes learning from whoa i could have handled, i could have handled that better <laughs> and learning and getting better and more elegant and more graceful and dealing with the inevitability of change, growth, evolution, and improvement in your life. And yeah, it may be three steps forward and two steps back at times, but don't focus just on the two steps back. We're moving forward. We're getting smarter. We're getting better. And meditation and mindfulness in your daily life and affairs will expand your awareness. See, stress and tension shatters it. Relax, let go. You'll see the bigger picture, you'll understand more, and it'll be so much easier to go with that flow, that inevitable change. Well, Linda, do we have any comments or questions at this point? Not yet, but I was uh, thinking about your... Um let me get my phone to turn on. It doesn't like my fingers. I think they're too cold. The, the little quote you sent out from Viktor Frankl um, about not being able to change our situation, so we have to change ourselves. Of course, that was his experience. Um, his experience informed him he was a Jew in World War II that was interred in a concentration camp, and he was one of the few that lived. And that book hit me so hard. I read it in high school. A lot, a lot of kids had to. He talked about, he, he was a psychiatrist. I think he was one then as well. Uh, he would watch people go to bed at night, internees go to bed at night, and he would watch them give up. And sometimes they would say, I, I just give up. And they wouldn't wake up in the morning. And I'm not sure what to draw from that in the in the face of such profound suffering in the conditions that were not compatible with life. He also talked about the capos, the 
the internees who, um, I don't know, for whatever reason, couldn't take it anymore. And they sided with their captors and they became some of the cruelest, capos were just a step under the guards and they became some of the cruelest internees to their fellow uh, concentration camp uh, uh, internees, uh, fellow Jews. And, and they, he said they were worse to them than the, than the Nazis. Of course, they, they were appointed to do the dirty work. It's such a, a, a revelationary story, uh, bears rereading. And I, I guess I, it's taken me a while for that concept to sink in um, because then it goes to mind over matter and Norman Vincent Peale and I get kind of stuck in all that. You know, Melinda, if your mind were right, your back wouldn't hurt. So it, it gets to a little bit of a slippery slope, but I, I do appreciate um, the, the fact that there really isn't much else I can do besides look within, do the practice, look within and see what, what comes of it. I, one more thing I just wanted to add, I just drove back from San Diego to Phoenix and that drive used to terrify me. It would, for days, I would be on the edge of my chair. It's going to happen. I'm about to have an accident, a breakdown. I'm going to have a flat tire. It's going to happen. And I've been doing the work coming to class, practicing the technique when I would get those thoughts. And this time back, I almost forgot, I almost forgot to be afraid. A couple of times I thought, well, am I going to have a flat tire? And then I just said, you know, you've got Michelins with lots of tread and it had, hasn't happened yet. And I would do my practice and, and I, I just wasn't gripped with that fear. So I guess it's bearing fruit, but I just wondered what your comment would be on Victor Frankl's quote that you posted. Well, what you've reminded me of is the Milgram experiment. And uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, this was a famous experiment where the subject of the experiment thought that they were the a participant in administering the experiment. And the person who they thought was the subject of the experiment was in fact in on the in on the experiment. So it was a role reversal. And the subject of the experiment, who thought he was an aide to the experimenter, was told to 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 question the subject who was in another room and they had a audio link, but they could not see each other. And every time the supposed subject of the experiment answered wrong, he had to administer a little shock and then increase the voltage. And of course, <laughs> because the uh, person being asked the questions was in on it, uh, they knew to shout and yell as the voltage increased and the dial that the guy turned to increase the voltage was clearly labeled uh, dangerous, extremely dangerous, fatal. On the high end, the experimenter said, the experiment requires that you continue. And so the person who didn't realize he was the subject of the experiment continues to administer shocks at every wrong answer, turning the dial up higher and higher to extremely painful and even fatal. And here's the point. If he or she complained to the guy in the white coat with the stopwatch and the clipboard, all he said was the experiment requires that you continue. Nothing else. Simply, the experiment requires that you continue. But of course, he had the white coat, the kind of priestly garb, and the authority of the clipboard and the stopwatch. And so, some inordinately high number, 85, 90, 93% of these people were administering what they thought to be fatal electrical shocks 
only because the experiment required that they continue. So this is a terrifying insight into the psyche of human beings and their willingness to conform to perceived authority. And so when you talk about the, the Jewish people in the concentration camp who had an opportunity to actually be treated like human beings, provided they stopped acting like human beings and, and became oppressors and torturers, um, I can see uh, most human beings being able to rationalize that and losing their compassion and losing their ability to empathize completely by identifying with authority. And I'm not going to get off on a tangent about it, but we see uh, the rise of fascism in this country, of autocracy, uh, a passion for authority and autocracy and dictatorship and tyranny. We see it in uh, Italy now. We see it in France. Um, it's in Hungary and Turkey. Uh, we saw it with Brexit to some extent in, in Britain. Uh, and a lot of it is race-related, but authoritarianism is on the rise. And it says a lot about the ability of human beings to rationalize and become that authority. You know, I, I, I'll tolerate an authoritarian government as long as I'm one of those who are in authority. And I'm willing to give up freedom and democracy um, because there's something about it that scares me and, and intimidates me, even if it's just this... Uh, this illusion that there's someone here who is other than the fear of the other. Again, all fear is fear of the unknown. So it's the problem with segregation and isolation. People think you're different for the craziest reasons, you know. Skin color, imagine, it's just absurd. So I don't know, uh, the Milgram experiment is sort of a terrifying thing to want to look at our potential, especially when it is happening all around us. So many of our neighbors are going, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give up on democracy. I mean, it was okay as long as white people were running the democracy, but it's getting more pluralistic. And if, if, if I can enjoy that, uh, that extra uh, privilege that comes with being a white person, then I'll, I'll go for the autocratic, I'll go for the fascist, I'll, I'll go for the dictator as long as it's us. It's terrifying. Uh, not sure what else to say about that other than that's what the Milgram experiments, what I thought of when you brought up that, uh, what's the other word for it? Schadenfreude? No, that's not it. What is the... Um, that's where you take pleasure in somebody's suffering. Um, what What is it where you, um, Patty Hearst in the SLA, where you begin to... Stockholm sympath Syndrome. Stockholm Syndrome, that's it, exactly, yeah. So maybe that's another way of looking at it. What do you think? Yeah, it sounds right. I just looked up Wikipedia, Milgram Experiment. By the way, that's M-I-L-G-R-A-M. Uh, Fascinating, it, it just briefly says they measured the willingness of study participants from a diverse range of occupations during education to obey an authority figure who instructed them to perform acts conflicting with their personal conscience. And now the shocks weren't real, right? None of the no. shocks was real, but that no. person quote receiving the shocks was told to act as though they were getting worse and worse. Right. It's but a it's a fascinating look into uh, what makes us tick and good for us that we haven't become fatalistic and sort of given up because this can all get almost our, our, our base animal nature, uh, survival nature uh, is, is pretty hard to, to uh, contend with sometimes. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a whole different track from 
our focus today, but I'm fine with it. It it is it is frightening. We're in that we're in a very dark period when it comes to this. The, we're so stressed that this is one of the major consequences of global warming and and COVID and uh, the disparity in the economy of the of the rich having plundered the economy and then the poor turning on each other. Imagine that the working poor haven't figured out that the enemy is the billionaires who stole all the money. Instead, they turn on other working poor people. It's just like if they ever figure it out, yeah. stop voting against their own uh, uh, interest. Well, interest. But I know, Michael, you and I would talk about this even before class started back in what was it January and your answer seems so simplistic uh, that it irritated me. Work on yourself, go inside. And, and, you know, I've come to realize the profound nature of that mandate that there's, it, it, it relieves me from a lot of personal frustration at what you just talked about. I mean, at least it gives me a place to go when I feel it. Like, oh yeah, I can go in and then I can be as kind to people as I can be uh, outwardly. That's my, that's my job. Yeah, it's adversity. Yeah, it's not trivial at all. And everyone, imagine people in this room doing that as best they can every day. It, you know, we never see the other side of it. If we treat someone cruelly, where does that go? Adversity promotes growth. You know the story of the, the uh, butterfly halfway out of the cocoon. If you cut it out and help it out of the cocoon, it'll never fly. Oh, I forgot about that. That's a good yeah. one. That's a good one to remember. It it needs this. It needs the struggle. Of uh, it, what it does is it struggling out of the uh, uh, cocoon in this case, uh, different than a bird coming out of an egg, but the same ring pass knot that forces fluids into the wings, that then allow the muscles to develop and the uh, ver and the uh, butterfly in time becomes strong enough to fly and may live for three or four days. That's, uh, but if you cut it out, if it gets halfway out or it's ready, to, it's starting to come out and you cut it out thinking you're doing it a favor, it'll never fly. And uh, everyone who's ever been a parent should think about uh, the challenge of finding that balance when you raise a kid and protect them as a dependent, but as they grow to little, a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, uh, transfer responsibility to the child and let them make a couple of mistakes and let them experience the consequences of their poor decisions and gradually transition that responsibility so that they come out as independent adults and not codependent with some arrested emotional development living in the basement, you know? Yeah. Becoming expert in video games and nothing else. So there's a lot to all of this, but... Um, Knowing the self, what else is there? Uh, I, I often say the purpose of life is to grow and evolve. And the meaning of life is the way in which each individual does that. We, we find meaning by following our heart and, and being what we care about, what we love, uh, pursuing uh, not only wisdom, but the embodiment of virtue. To, to see the self-interest in being selfless. Imagine, what a contradiction. The self-interest in being selfless suggests that there are at least two degrees of self. The selfish self, the separated, lonely, struggling self, and a higher self, a sense of individuality that is aware of being connected to all things. It's uh, it's a funny place to end the class on today, but it's really 
the most fundamental difference between Buddhism and Hinduism <laughs> is that whole idea of the higher self or the soul and whether it exists. Uh, because the Buddhist would say even awareness is an illusion. Uh, they, they go so far as to say ultimately there's, it's all empty and there's just a void. That even awareness itself rises up. The Hindu, the non-dualist, Advaita Vedanta, we'll talk more about Advaita Vedanta and non-dualism, uh, rises up out of a ground of awareness, that all things rise up out of awareness, that awareness is fundamental. It's a, it's a curious distinction. Otherwise, Buddhism is a lot like Hinduism in the non-dual nature of reality. And, and yet here we are separating it and breaking it up into subjects and objects, and then beyond that, tiny little bits and pieces. So, the universe is impermanent, the law of impermanence. Today we talked about dealing with that inevitable change. It's not just random, it's growthful. It's an unfolding of potential, it's not just evolution. It's even more than evolution. It's an unfolding of our divine nature. What we're doing here and what we're for is redeeming our animal impulses to divine awareness. I'll say it that way. We right now, each and every one of us in this class, is both an animal body illumined and animated by a loving spirit or energy. And we have the impulses of the animal in our Eating, survival, procreation, in our anger, in our fear, in our hatred, in animosity. That's all animal nature. But we have this love and light in us. And it's up to each one of us in the middle somewhere to redeem the anger and the fear and the animosity. The, the animal side, which you might call the evil side, the selfish, self-centered, survival-oriented side, to the spiritual understanding of all is one. And it's all true. You know, the paradox of the one and the many. Be that change agent. Replace a negative with a positive. Respond to hurtful comments with kindness. Respond to ignorance and confusion with awareness and understanding and, and insight. And, and be compassionate and loving. And then you'll find that change can be a fun thing, something to look forward to. The freshness of each new moment. Imagine the freshness, the excitement, the curious adventure of life unfolding before you. Like a, you know, like those movies of, fl those time lapse movies of flowers that blossom in five seconds instead of five days. <laughs> well, what if you looked at your whole life as unfolding like that? Just this ecstatic expression of newness and wonder and development. and That's what it's all about. That's really what it's all about. Roll with it. Flow with it. Change is a good thing when it's growthful. Okay. Anything uh, pending, Melinda? Any outstanding business? I think we're all done. Okay, friends, thank you for being here. I'd like you to each unmute just long enough. You'll see it in the lower left down there. Unmute your audio and say so long to everybody. And uh, I will say to you, namaste, aloha, salam, and thank you for being here. I hope you can join us next week, 11 o'clock California time for uh, Wisdom of the Soul. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, everybody. everybody. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Melinda. Bye-bye, Patrick. Bye-bye, Patrick.